take your Bibles, <clears throat> excuse me, this morning and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 5. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 5 is where we're going to look at this morning. <clears throat> the title of my message this morning is The Battle of the Gods. The Battle of the Gods. You'll see in a moment what this is talking about, but an interesting story that happens here in <clears throat> the history of Israel and the life of Israel. And um, of course, so many stories told throughout the Old Testament. And uh, just to give you a little bit of background to come up to this chapter, chapter 5, and we'll look at the entire chapter in a few moments. But just to give you a little bit of background of what is going on here is that first of all, we see in chapter 1, we see the birth of Samuel and the miraculous birth that was involved with him and his mother Hannah and his father and, and all of that and how she prayed for a child and God miraculous, miraculously gave her a son and this son is Samuel. And so we see in chapter 1, the birth of Samuel. In chapter 2, we see Samuel presented to the temple <clears throat> because Hannah promised, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. And he brings Samuel to the temple and Eli was the high priest and she pre presents uh, him to the Lord. And uh, Samuel then, um, in this process, Samuel is presented to the Lord and he lives there at the temple to work in the temple and be a man of God. In chapter 3 then, we see the call of Samuel the call upon his life, not just, you know, not just being presented by your parents to the Lord, does it make you uh, a servant of God? There needs to be a call. God needs to call you. I mean, I, I, I know that when I went to Bible college, we used to say that there were a lot of young people in, in Bible college that were mama called and papa sent. You know what I mean? And, uh, but I believe it ought to be the call of God that you want to full-time serve the Lord. And so <clears throat> we see the call of God upon Samuel. And Samuel, um, he presents himself to the Lord to be used by God. And he says in, in verse 16 there, he says, Here am I, whatever God you want me to do. And, and uh, during this time, something I want to point out, something that happens here. In chapter 3, starting at verse number 11, just to give you a little background to what's going on here is um, during this call of Samuel, and the Lord said in verse 11, chapter 3, verse 11, and the Lord said to Samuel, um, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. You ever hear something that made your ears tingle? In verse number 12, in that day I will perform against Eli. All things which I have spoken concerning his house. Now, Eli was a high priest of God. And God's speaking about his judgment against Eli. Isn't that amazing? Let's go on. Verse uh, 12. When I begin, I will also make an end. Then verse 13. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. Because his sons made themselves vile. And he restrained them not. Why was the judgment coming against Eli? Not just because his, son, his sons did wicked, but because he did not restrain them. He just let them go. And just let them do whatever. It seems like, if you think about it for a minute, it probably was that way from the very beginning when they were born in the house. And they ran around the house as little boys, tearing up things, as little boys do. Amen. Boys will be boys. Amen. Tearing up things and making a mess and all that. And uh, it seems like Eli never did restrain them. Well, that's a sad thing. It causes violence. And because of, they did vile. Verse 14. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. Wow, those are some strong words. God says the judgment's going to come. And no matter what you say or what you do, you're past the point of repentance. And he says, by the way, there is a point 
of repentance where there's no more. You know what I'm saying? Um, we talk about the unpardonable sinner. We talk about, uh, some have said uh, they, um, you know, got to the place of a reprobate sinner. They've gotten past the point where God doesn't deal with them anymore. That's a sad place to be. I believe that I have met some people that are in that state. I remember witnessing to a guy and him mocking God and mocking the Bible and the things of God. And I'm telling you, in the flesh, I felt like punching him in the mouth. So I let my flesh calm down and I let the Holy Spirit of God take care of him. Amen. Amen. God can do a better job than I can do, right? But I've met some people I thought were that way. Isn't that, wow, that is harsh. God is harsh. God is just. He is holy. And He will do what is right. Who are we to draw the line? God draws the line. Right? God does. God had dealt with Eli about this already before. He said in verse 13, The iniquity which he knoweth. I've talked to him about this. God said, I've dealt with him about this. And Eli refused, even though he was the high priest in the temple of God, he was supposed to be, he and his family were supposed to be an example to all of Israel. And he refused it. Wow. Sad. Well, the Bible says here about Eli. Really sad. You can compare Eli then later on to Samuel. <laughs> Samuel did what God said, and God blessed Samuel and his life. But judgment came upon Eli and his house. The, the end of verse 14, his house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. Wow. Wow, that's powerful. In chapter 4, we come to chapter 4. Because of this, all of Israel suffered. Because of the sin of one man, passed upon his family, passed upon Israel, passed upon the house of God and their worship, passed upon the whole nation, and the whole nation suffered. Because in chapter 4, they're smitten by the Philistines. The Philistines, their enemy, comes in, and the Israelites are defeated by the Philistines. You know, it's simple. All they had to do was trust God, and lean upon God, and God would, God would take care of them. I mean, we see example after example of that in the Bible. We see when God provided... <clears throat> a judge to them by the name of Samson. And Samson did what was wrong, but still, uh, Samson was used by God to, to stop the Philistines on many occasions. And so these wicked people, these Philistines, came against the people of God. And the Bible says in chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, notice there, So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant, of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. Hold on, let me stop right there a minute. Where is the Ark of Covenant supposed to be? In the temple, in the Holy of Holies. Nowhere else. It's not supposed to be brought out. In verse number four, and the two sons of Eli, here they are, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God, verse 5, and when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. Now, here they go. They go take the Ark of the Covenant, and they bring it out there. Hophni and Phinehas were part of this. They had no regard for God. They did not obey God. They were rebellious sons and brothers here, and they brought out the Ark of the Covenant of God, and Israel shouted because of the Ark of the Covenant was there. Now, let me kind of bring this forward. I, I don't know if you've heard tell or saw the movie, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, the story was the Nazis were trying to get the Ark because wherever the Ark went, uh, they were a conquering force, and I don't know that... I, it's just a story, there's no truth to it, because nobody knows where the ark is. Uh, well, I shouldn't say nobody, maybe some, but anyhow. Folks, listen, God doesn't follow the ark of the covenant. 
He had the Ark of the Covenant made not to be worshipped, but to represent Him. And it's not the Ark of the Covenant, it's God, see? When we come together and we, and we sing songs and we, we have messages and we preach the Word of God, we're not worshipping an article like, I think the Ark of the Covenant was probably about the size of this communion table. We're not here to worship a table with gold and with angels. We're not here to worship a table. We're here to worship God. And so it did symbolize him. It was important to them, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, because of what it symbolized. But listen, God could be there or God could not be there, right? With the Ark of the Covenant. And they brought it out there and they all shouted. And then we see later on in the chapter The Philistines won the battle. It didn't matter if they had the ark or not. But look what happened in verse 11. The ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. I think God was teaching, I know God was teaching Israel a lesson. Teaching them a lesson. And so now at this point, the two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. God's judgment upon them. And because of all of that happening, poor Eli, verse number 18, and it came to pass when he made mention of the ark, a a messenger comes to tell Eli, and he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off his seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and he died, for he was an old man and heavy And he had judged Israel 40 years. He fell off his seat there and broke his neck and died because of what he allowed to take place and he did not restrain them. Sad. Really sad. And probably here is the, some more sad news, probably worse than before, verse 22. And she said, the glory is departed from Israel For the ark of God is taken. The symbol of God to them was gone now. Was gone. God's hand of blessing was off of Israel. They suffered a great defeat. The high priest died and his boys were killed. and, And the ark of God is gone. Now that brings us up to my message in chapter 5. The battle of the gods. Now we see something interesting. Chapter 5 is a great chapter. And we're going to look at it, the whole thing, all right? And uh, uh, look at what it says here. I want you to notice, first of all, my first point to the message is this. God proves His power. God proves His power. I'm sorry, I have to glance back. We got these new screens up there, and I just want to, I just want to look at them once in a while, all right? So pardon me <laughs> for that. But anyhow, God proves His power In verses 1 through 5. Let's look at chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Now, wonder why they did this. Their God was called Dagon that somebody had made. And so they bring the ark of the covenant in there to set it up by their God. Wow. Two gods under one roof. Something's going to happen here. Amen. And when they of Ashdod, verse 3, arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. Don't you love that? I just love that. He was on his face to, (laughs) to the ark of the covenant. And they took Dagon and set him back in his place. Can you imagine when they came in? What has happened here? It was a symbol, right? It was God's symbol. All the other gods bow to me because I am God and there is none else. Amen? Just like the Bible says. Where are we? Verse 4. And when they rose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. I mean, his head 
came off in the fall. And uh, can you see the angels of God in there in the middle of the night saying, Hey, watch this. Push that thing over. Wham! And it came down, the head busted off, and both of his hands, which were made out of whatever it was, stone or wood or whatever, who could never help anybody, who could never reach out to anybody, a false god. Only the stump of Dagon was left him. Verse 5, Therefore neither the priest of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. I mean, it changed them forever, right? Let me tell you something. God, our God, the God of heaven, is an almighty God. There are no gods beside our God. Dagon was on his face twice before the Ark of the Covenant to show them and to prove to them who God was. Now, don't you think that when the Philistines came and saw this had taken place, they should have said, the God of heaven, he is God. Right? God gave them a chance to repent. God gave them a chance to get right. But instead, they they said no. Our God is almighty God. Our God is not disturbed in the least by the threat of anything made by man's hands. He is not fearful of demotion by what any power on this earth mistakenly supposes it can build or ideas it can conjure up. Our God is almighty, which means he is in control no matter what is thrown at him. He rules and reigns even those who infer that he doesn't even exist. There is not one concept, listen to me, there is not one concept, one invention, one idea, one skill, one subject, one situation, one object, one person that causes the God of heaven to shudder in the least. Not one. Not one. Because our God is God. He's not afraid. He's not afraid. Look what happens. Look what God does. Well, we we have an example. Before I go on to that, we have an example of that. Satan tried to be equal with God, didn't he? And he failed. He failed. And so what Satan does is he tries to make things more important to you than God. We look at this, we say it's an idol, just an idol. But if we're not careful, we get idols in our lives. People today, all around us are worshiping all kinds of things. Today on a Sunday morning, when they ought to be in the house of God, they're out having their pleasures because they worship pleasure more than they worship God. I go down here by, on my way to church, I pass by a a couple of sports fields and you can go down here by the... uh, by the Hall of Fame, and you'll see kids out there practicing football and practicing baseball and practicing all kinds of sports instead of being in the house of God this morning where they ought to be because they love their sports more than they love God. Let me tell you something. A country that loves its pleasure in sports more than God is a country that's in trouble. Big trouble. That's what they worship and that's what they want. I think of a young man that came to our church when I pastored in Canada that had all the potential in the world. Great young man, working for the Lord, serving the Lord, and got to the place where I thought that I was going to turn over our junior church to him and because he was doing such a great thing. But he allowed Satan to get in and the silliest little thing took him away from the service of God and the work of God and messed up his life. He could have been a servant of God. That's what he wanted. That's what he said he wanted. But he followed the things of the world, became an idol to him, and he spent more time with those things of the world than he did in the house of God and with God, and it took him away. And today... All these years later, he still is paying. He still is paying because he made the wrong choice. Who are you going to follow? Who are you going to serve? The Philistines should have had enough sense 
to fall down and worship God. But let me tell you, people today in America ought to have enough sense to listen to God. God has no equals. The Philistines put, put Dagon and the ark together. <laughs> what took place? Amen. Bowed before God, before that ark of God, which represented God. God should be first priority in our lives. He ought to be first place in our lives. We come to worship God, and God ought to be on the throne of your life, and ought to be the king of your heart. And you ought to follow God's will and God's ways, number one. I want you to notice, secondly here, we'll start in verse number six. My second point is this, God shows his displeasure. God shows his displeasure. Let's begin reading in verse number six and see what takes place here. The Bible says, But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and, and smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. So all are, Ashdod and, and that area where they had put the Ark of the Covenant, the whole area started suffering because of the Ark of God. Why? Because, folks, it was in the wrong place. Israel, Israel had let this happen, and now it's in the wrong place. Verse 7, and when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, the Ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand, his hand, God's hand, is sore upon us and upon Dagon, our God. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. And they carried the ark of the God of Israel about hither, thither, excuse me, Gath. They took it to another place, Gath. You remember Gath? Doesn't that have significance? Goliath of Gath, okay? Maybe Goliath was a little boy around there at this time. Because in chapter 17, that's when we see Goliath. I don't think he was very little, but he was a boy at one time, okay? Maybe he was, a, you know, 10 years old and 6 foot 11 or whatever. Uh, verse 9, and it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city with small and great, <clears throat> both small and great. And they had emeralds in their secret parts. Now, indication tells us that this thing of emeralds was kind of like hemorrhoids, what we call today. I mean, it can be debilitating, trust me. Verse number 10, therefore, they sent the ark of God to Ekron, not Akron. Okay. Akron, maybe Akron needs that. Needs, Akron needs God, I will say that, amen. The ark of God to Ekron, and it came to pass, as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, they have brought, look at this, they have brought about the ark of God of Israel to us, to slay us and our people. Don't bring it here, we're all going to die. Can you see him? Like, why are you bringing it here? So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go again into its own place. Where's its own place? Back in the temple, right? That it slay us not and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. Now notice here. Wherever it went, there was disease. There were people dying. Hey, listen, God doesn't need Israel to destroy his enemies. God has a sword of his own. Amen. God can destroy people any way he chooses, any way he pleases. People say back in the Old Testament, you know, Israel went out and, and they killed every person in a city, the, uh, the, the people and the, and the uh, women and the children and God, it wasn't that terrible. Well, God, God doesn't need a, 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 an army to walk in. God can just send a disease and kill them all or send um, um, fire and brimstone. If he wants to. He could turn the whole city to a pillar of salt if he wanted to. Right? Why? Because God is God. Right? And don't argue with him. He knows what he's doing. 
God has ways of taking care. He doesn't need us to help take care of Him. Right? He can take care of Himself. And praise God, He can take care of us. Amen? Amen? He can take care of us. Don't tamper with God's property. Did you hear me? Don't tamper with God's property. We call this Bible the Word of God. You better not tamper with the Word of God. God gives you warning here. Take your Bibles and turn back to the last chapter of the last book. Before the Bible is closed out, He gives a warning once again in Revelation chapter 22, as He has already in the beginning of the Bible, the middle of the Bible, and now at the end of the Bible, He gives this warning. Don't tamper with God's property. The Bible is His Word. Don't mess with it. One of them that tried to translate into different English and use different words and used a, 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 a bad translation that had lost his voice after he messed with God's Word. And he said before he died, I lost my voice because I messed with God's Word. Look what it says in Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. How would you like the plagues of the Bible put upon you? Verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Don't mess with God's property. We have another example in the book of Daniel where uh, Belshazzar the king said, bring all, of the, bring all of the utensils and things that were dedicated in the temple to the house of God and, and we're going to have a drunken feast and we're going to use those things uh, to get drunk and have a feast. And God said, wrote with a finger on the wall and he said to that king, tonight you're going to lose your kingdom. Don't mess with God's property. Don't mess with God's church. This is not your church and not my church. It's God's church. And you better not mess with God's church because God says the gates of hell will not prevail against His church. So we stand for Christ. We go forward because it belongs to Him. Hey, here's another one. You better not mess with God's man. You better not mess with God's man. The Bible says obey them that have the rule over you. You better hold them in respect and honor God's man. Don't tamper with God's property. Look, look what it says here in 1 Samuel chapter 5 again. Look what it says in verse 6. The Bible says, but the hand of the Lord was what? Heavy upon them. Go to the end of verse number 11. The hand of God was very what? Heavy there. Do you want to be under God's... Heavy judgment? Hey, I don't want to be under God's light judgment. Let alone His heavy judgment. God does bring judgment. He does. If you mess with His property. They moved the ark around. They took it from Ashdod. They took it to Gath. Then they tried to take it over to Ekron. Ekron said, don't bring it here. We don't want that. that leads me to my last point. My third and last point. Is the Philistines, how do they react? The Philistines cry out. Look here at chapter 5, verse 12, and then chapter 6, verse 1. The Bible says, And the men that died not were smitten with emeralds, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. Seven months they suffered. The people cried. They didn't cry a cry of repentance. They just cried a cry of relief. Now let me tell you something. <clears throat> Salvation is not for you to get out of the problem you've gotten yourself into. 
I think a lot of people, I, I preached in jails, had ministry in jails. I think a lot of those in jail, just because they're in jail, oh yeah, they'll get saved. They just want delivered out of that jail. They don't care about being delivered from sin. You see, there's a difference. There's a difference. This cry of the Philistines was not a cry of repentance, not a cry out to God like, save us and we'll accept you as our God. No, they just wanted some relief. They cried, they cried out for relief. You know, I've seen people that have come to the altar of this, this church, come to the altar, kneel down here <clears throat> and pray a prayer and go out <clears throat> just as lost as when they came in. Because all they wanted delivered out of this problem that I'm in right now, I'm not worried about the future or anything else. Let me tell you something. True salvation is asking Him to forgive you of all your sins. Past, present, and future. Not just this one sin I'm in right now. All your sins. And the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse away all your sin. Past, present, and future. It's that point of repentance and turning to Christ. People seem today to want safety, not a Savior. You know what I'm saying? The, this, this Philistines there, uh, their shouts of triumph when they, when they won the battle back there in chapter 4 turned into lamentation because they took of something that belonged to God. People, many people live their lives in sin now, but let me tell you something, judgment is coming. There will be a judgment day. Boy, how long it took, it took the Philistines of suffering before they learned a lesson. In verse number one of chapter six, for seven months they suffered. How long does God have to bring judgment before people will turn around and truly repent. Truly turn around and face God. How long does it take? Well, if we look back in the history of Israel, when they were in Egypt, it took ten plagues. Why didn't it just take one or two? Why are people so stubborn? We're facing in our nation today people that are stubborn. They don't want to humble themselves before God. Why? Because we've got too much pride in this country. And pride is sin. Now they're selling hats that say pride on there. They have shirts that say pride on there. Colored by the rainbow, which is supposed to represent our God. And they're doing the same thing the Philistines did. Right? I mean, pride is a sin. Sin against God. We look at the wicked world out there and we say, how shameful, it ought to be shame. That's what they ought to say. But what about your pride? What about yours and mine? Amen? We're all human beings. We all have a natural pride to us. God says we need to humble ourselves before Him. Hey, isn't that how you got saved? You came to Christ and said, I can't save myself. I'm lost and I cannot save myself. Please, God, save me. And you know what he does when you ask him that? He saves. Amen? Jesus saves. God is not pleased when we get our priorities wrong. When we put other things up in our lives as priority instead of Him, you'll face the judgment of God. You'll face the chastisement of God. But if you're here today and never been saved, what will it take for you to turn to God, really turn to God, and trust Him as Lord and Savior? If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, Jesus came to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. If you'll just come by faith and trust Him, humbly before God and say, God, I can't save myself. I need you. I need a Savior. And He will save you. <laughs>